Hello. Um, I thought after the frivolity of the first three spe speakers, you, you, could, you could do with something a little more serious. Um, I thought we might start with a little uh, audience participation, because I know that's the kind of thing you do here. Um, could everyone say after me the word air? air. And now could you say hair? And now could you say the word lair? Yeah. And now could you say all three at once? Yeah. Eh, hello! <laughs> nice, nice you could be with us. That was, um, that was roughly how uh, Princess Margaret used to speak. So that's lesson one in Princess Margaret studies. And in a funny way, though the Queen um, changed her accent, if you'd listened to recordings of the Queen in 1950, it's very, very different now. She's sort of dumbed down her accent in a way. Princess Margaret stayed with her accent. And that was, I think, because uh, she always felt a very strong sense of being royal. She loved the word the in her name. It was HRH, the Princess Margaret. And she loved um, being the, she'd boast at dinner parties. One of her icebreakers was to say that she was the daughter of a king and the uh, sister of a queen and as such, the only person on the planet who could you know, claim that. Um, and so that was, uh, that was her attitude, which, which rather dogged her life, as I think we shall see. Um, this is uh, her aged, she must be about five or just six, because uh, George V, her grandfather, died in 1936. She was born in 1930. And this is uh, Queen Mary. Um, Oddly enough, she, she, the royal family have, a, uh, have uh, one of the characteristics is they all react to previous generations. So obviously George V was very serious and dour and dull compared to King Edward VII, who was a great kind of playboy. And uh, Princess Margaret, his granddaughter, was um, a strong reaction, I think, to George V and Queen Mary, both of whom she said in later life... Um, and she said to Queen Mary that she detested her and that she thought that Queen Mary had a chip on her shoulder because her granddaughter was posher than she was. Um, uh, she also was always very, very keen on the arts and Bohemia, Princess Margaret, and that was also a great reaction to her grandparents. Uh, George V and Queen Mary once went to the new exhibition of Cezanne and George V shouted over to Queen Mary, come over here, May, this will make you laugh. So that was the sort of uh, environment she was born into. And of course, uh, George VI was also quite uh, dour in his, in his way. Um, she became um, a great, oh, I've just realized I haven't turned over this. But <laughs> uh, um, uh, she became um, a great sex symbol which might now seem to us bizarre, though I think this uh, picture might convince some people. Um, uh, this is her at about, I think, aged about 25. Uh, um, and she had a lot of uh, people uh, attracted to her. I have, uh, um, perhaps I should explain a little bit about uh, my book called Ma'am Darling. Its subtitle is 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret. I wanted to do a, um, a different kind of biography. Um, I was fed up with biographies of all people, not just royal family writers, never, just working doggedly from cradle to grave. I thought that's not how one sees one's life. And anyone sees your life. If you think about your life, you're thinking from where you are now, you're thinking into the future, you're thinking backwards, you think about when you were seven, you're thinking about what you will be like when you're 84. And I wanted to convey some of that kind of kaleidoscopic view. And also I wanted to convey within this kaleidoscope how people see Prince Margaret, she, Princess Margaret. She, other than the Queen, she must have met more people than anyone else on earth. The Queen is obviously a professional kind of meter and greeter in a way. Um, and Princess Margaret, uh, um, one of the oddities about the Queen is she doesn't really register people. I mean, she has the same six or seven questions she asks everyone. She does it very uh, dutifully. She, she's an uh, expert in not saying anything of interest back. So no one can ever remember what she said to them. 
Princess Margaret was rather different. In a way, she was a sort of um, pantomime version of the Queen in that she, she always said the wrong thing rather than uh, the right thing, as we shall see. Anyway, to go back to the, um, the people who fancied her, I have uh, various chapters of different people who fancied her. One of them, uh, John Fowles, rather creepily uh, fancied her. I wanted to put her in a, uh, in a cave underground. Um, rather more jolly uh, was John Betchman. He's here been seen given, uh, he's been awarded a prize by her, the Duff Cooper Prize, and he was sweating with, uh, with lust, people said, um, and so much so that his, his friend, the waspish Don Morris Bower, uh, composed this, uh, this parody of a Betchman poem. Green with lust and sick with shyness, let me lick your lacquered toes. Gosh, oh gosh, your royal highness, put your finger up my nose. Pin my teeth upon your dress, plant my head with watercress. Only you can make me happy, tuck me tight beneath your arm. Wrap me in a woolen nappy, let me wet it till it's warm. In a plush and plated pram, wheel me round St. James's, ma'am. Lightly plant your plimsolled heel where my privy parts congeal. Um, she was also... Uh, Fancy. This is the only time she, she touched Picasso, as it were. But Picasso, uh, and it's only really recently been disclosed, and I've laid it out fully in my book because it's so fascinating. Picasso had a, a, an at least 15-year obsession, sexual obsession with Princess Margaret, um, which he told uh, in confidence to his friend, uh, the uh, Tate Gallery curator, Roland Penrose. Roland Penrose put it all in his notebooks and also uh, kept the letters to and from Picasso. Um, Picasso sometimes said that he dreamt of three in a bed with Princess Margaret and the Queen. Um, this is all written down and documented. Um, and uh, when Princess Margaret finally came round the uh, Picasso exhibition at the Tate Gallery, and I think about 1961, you can just see uh, Snowden behind her. Um, Roland Penrose gave a very, very uh, flowery account to Picasso, pretending that uh, Princess Margaret had blushed at the mere mention of his name, um, when in fact it, all she'd said is, oh, isn't it funny that he has two eyes on the side of the person's face in the portrait and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but this did nothing, well, it did everything to, to uh, keep uh, Picasso's uh, ardor going. Um, uh, but uh, when... Some years later, John Richardson, Picasso's uh, biographer, told all this information to Princess Margaret when she was in her 50s. And she said, alas, uh, she said it was the most disgusting thing she'd ever heard. So that's, that's Picasso done for. Um, this is, uh, this is, well, I don't have to tell you who this is. Uh, <laughs> there's Ringo, Paul, John. John was another blusher, and, and I'll, I'll tell you another person who uh, was rendered speechless, which John was here, at the, which is the premiere of Hard, Hard Day's Night uh, in, I think, 1964. Um, uh, Marlon Brando also had, uh, had asked Kenneth Tynan uh, if he could have lunch, who is a friend of Princess Margaret, a big friend of Princess Margaret, if he could, he could have lunch, he could arrange lunch. And uh, Kenneth Tynan in his diary said that Marlon Brando couldn't say a thing all lunchtime. He was so in awe of Princess Margaret. So it is very strange how, I mean, it's obviously not just sex appeal. It was the fact of her being the queen's sister and the kind of grandeur. And so she was at this, she was sort of almost at her height in this. She'd have been 34. Um, George Harrison, the youngest of the Beatles, and only 21, was actually one of the few people uh, in the 20th century to have stood up to Princess Margaret. Uh, there was always a rule that you weren't allowed to eat before she did. And she'd often keep people waiting until sort of one in the morning before she decided to eat. And then of course, I mean like in uh, Stephen Frears uh, film um, about Queen Victoria, the minute she stopped eating then people were obliged to stop eating themselves. Um, but uh, after the premiere they had, went to the Dorchester for a, uh, a sort of launch party. Um, and uh, George Harrison, age 21, was very, very uh, peckish. 
And eventually, he was told this rule, and so he went up to Princess Margaret and said, look, we can't start eating till you've gone. And she said, well, I'd better be going then. So, yeah, so he's, he's scored one of the team. Um, uh, I love all these. I could spend my life uh, looking at pictures of celebrities shaking hands with the Queen, oh, yeah, or the Princess Margaret. Um, this is uh, from uh, right to left. There's Petula Clark, who, strangely enough, her husband then became um, Princess Margaret's boyfriend, Roddy Llewellyn's uh, record producer uh, some years later. Um, Frankie Howard, of course. And then we have Cindy Birdsong of the Supremes. Uh, this is what happened with Princess Margaret. Having enjoyed, uh, I think this was in the early 70s, having enjoyed this uh, moment in the, uh, in the sun, um, she, she was very affected by the fact that she, she loved her status. And when she was born in 1930, you know, piped bands were going up mountains with villages, 4,000 villages, beacons were lit, um, cannons were uh, uh, blasted. Um, and, but then, as the years went on, she then got to, uh, after the 1936, where uh, two, uh, the king died, another king abdicated, she suddenly went from four to number two in line. But after that, she felt, uh, when Prince Charles was born, she, she went number three, Princess Anne number four. So by the end of her life, she was behind um, Zara Phillips, or whatever, um, at number 11. And if she was alive today, she'd be number 17 behind uh, Mia Tyndall. Um, that and a, and a kind of disastrous uh, wedding, which had turned increasingly bitter, meant that she, she started being very, very rude to people. Um, one of them was the, uh, the Supremes. So that is Cindy Birdsong looking rather sourly at her. But Mary Wilson, who you can't see, the, another Supreme, um, Princess Margaret had whispered to her, is that a wig you're wearing? And in her autobiography, she says, I'm just a girl from the projects, but I know you don't say that to people in a party. Um, so she was always very adept at saying the wrong thing. Uh, this is another person she upset. As you can see, David Bowie on the, on the far left. If he'd, uh, he'd just done the laughing gnome. Um, Tiny Tim, of course. Uh, Dusty Springfield. Uh, Dusty Springfield uh, at the Royal Albert Hall saw that she was, um, she was talking during one of her songs. So she started the next song improvising. Uh, the la there's a lady talking when she shouldn't be or something. Um, and Margaret was so... Uh, and she also made lesbian allusions. Uh, to Princess Margaret, and uh, through the post the next day came a letter from Ken Kensington Palace with an apology that she was obliged to sign. And so she, so she wound up uh, Dusty Springfield. Um, Elizabeth Taylor, I have uh, a story from uh, the uh, very good biographer Selina Hastings, who attended a dinner party, which um, she uh, at Kensington Palace, Princess Margaret had invited especially uh, Elizabeth Taylor after her play, and then um, didn't let anyone talk to her. She completely ostracized her, and this was just a way of getting back to her. Uh, they'd had a long feud. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor had heard that Princess Margaret had called her a common little thing. Uh, they'd both had an affair with Eddie Fisher. Anyway, um, she, could, she could plan these revenges. Um, this is a marvelous picture. There we have Jack Nicholson shortly uh, before filming um, Postman Only, Lives, uh, Only Rings Twice. Uh, and one of uh, almost her only loyal male friend, Gore Vidal, who was rude about everyone else but thought she was marvelous. And he said, he wrote in one of his books that Princess Margaret always thought that because the, everyone wanted to see the queen as good, they'd see her as bad. Um, and so that she's blamed it on the public, but of course it was self-fulfilling prophecy, and she, she grew into this, this uh, role. Um, this is uh, Twiggy, who 10 years before, one of the most uh, famous people in the country, uh, Princess Margaret, had sat next to at dinner and hadn't spoken to all through the meal, and, uh, and uh, had eventually turned to her and said, what's your name? Of course she'd have known her name. And she said, because uh, everyone likes Twiggy, she's a nice person. She said, well, Leslie Hornby, ma'am, but my friends call me Twiggy. And Princess Margaret just replied, how unfortunate. Um, uh, Gary Glitter, it's rather a sad picture. There's Gary Glitter in prison, Mark Boland dead, 
uh, Russell Harty uh, dead. Almost his, in the last day, he took out, or the nurse helped take out his tracheotomy tube uh, because he had something to say uh, to Alan Bennett. And all he had to say was, Princess Margaret asked after me twice. Um, so the people still had an, an affection for, uh, for him. I'm just going to now read a tiny little bit, going back to the beginning. Um, what I was saying about trying to do a new sort of style of biography, I, um, Lytton Strachey, uh, who did the biography of Queen Victoria, this is a slight pastiche. He was very heavily criticized at the time for entering her dying thoughts. Um, but I think as long as you know it's, uh, it's an imaginative exercise, there's nothing wrong. So I just wrote this, uh, which I'll finish with, uh, Princess Margaret's dying thoughts. Yet perhaps in the secret chambers of consciousness, she had her thoughts too. Perhaps her fading mind called up once more the shadows of the past to float before it and retraced for the last time the vanished visions of that long history passing back and back through the cloud of years to older and even older memories, to the warm clasp of Crawfee, so full of do's and don'ts, to Sir Roy Strong's strange clothes and high demeanor, and her last afternoon with Peter, and Tony dancing attendance on her mother, and Roddy emerging from the sea at Mustique in his brand new trunks, and the audience hooting with laughter at Dusty Springfield's impertinent aside, and President Johnson steering her into the dinner in the White House, his right palm lingering perhaps a little too long on her royal behind, and the old queen, her grandmother, reprimanding her for erratic behavior with a bouncing ball, and Lilibet's voice down the telephone reassuring her once more that no harm had been done, and her mother laughing and saying, such fun, before giving her that pitying look, and her father on his final evening bidding her good night and see you in the morning. Thank you. <laughs>